understand that some some uh, individuals had expressed that they would like to discuss yesterday's talk a little bit more in depth or more practically. If there are any specific questions that anybody wants to ask, uh, I would gladly entertain it. Otherwise, I'll just try to bring it down a little bit more to practice. Yes, sir. Well, let me explain to you first of all. You will miss you're missing yesterday, so I'll explain to you what the the needle in the haystack um, allegory uh, was meant to illustrate. As I mentioned, right in this, as I said, the, the needle, you heard the expression needle in the haystack, finding a needle in the haystack. <clears throat> you know what a haystack is. A haystack is, if, if you ever if you ever went through by uh, um, fields, by open fields, they they cut the grass, and let the grass dry on the field. That becomes hay, and then they they bale the hay. They roll it up and it becomes a big bale, and then they load the bales one on top of the other and it becomes a stack. And there are millions of little uh, pieces of hay in there. If someone loses a needle in that stack and he wants to find it, it's virtually impossible. Okay? Ah, the you heard the expression in a different form. So I pointed out that as difficult as it is to find a needle in a haystack, it becomes even more difficult and close to impossible if you are not sure that the needle is there. If you are in doubt that the needle is there, then it becomes virtually impossible for a human being to look for that needle. And 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 this and this is where this is where the point was made that we're learning Torah, we're davening, we learn how to daven, we learn how to learn, we learn how to do mitzvahs. And we are continuously looking to get a greater sense of what it is and to understand what it's about and to relate to it more fully. We are looking for something that we have not yet identified. We want to get into it. We want to get involved with it. We want it to be ours. And in this process of looking, (coughs) 
this is where the analogy comes in. If we are sure and we clearly know what it is that we're looking for and that this which we're looking for is there to be found, then our effort is possible. We can have the patience and we can have the spirit to go after it day after day, week after week. Eventually, it begins to make sense. And eventually, we, we, we actually begin to relate to it. And eventually, we, it becomes ours. But if we do not have a clear idea of what it is that we're looking for, and therefore, we are not sure what we're looking for, we're not sure of, of, of its identity, we're not sure of its presence. So then, the process of looking for it becomes infinitely more difficult. We are constantly bombarded with self-doubt. We are constantly attacked by doubt. What am I doing? Where am I going? And even if we make every effort and we get involved, like we mentioned the other day, we stand over there in the washing machine in the middle of 770. It's still, yes, we get all sweated up and we get all uh, all bumped up. And, uh, and we still didn't find ourselves because we did not exactly know what it is that, that we're looking for. What does it mean to be a yid? Even before we can personally relate to it, but we have to have an identification, a definition. And this is where this, this illustration came in. And um, <clears throat> in brief, the point that, that was made in order to clarify, what is it that we're looking for? We put the, the, the following two views in contrast. And the reason we put these two views in contrast is because one view we were all exposed to prior to coming here, and that's exactly how we viewed the whole world and everything we come in contact with. And here we're coming with another view that is all-encompassing and, and, and is supposed to be the guide in our lives, and the guide for our lives. And therefore, we want to put it in contrast and understand clearly what it is that we're looking for, what it is that we want to relate to, I'll add, I'll embellish a little bit what we discussed yesterday and bring it a little bit perhaps clearer. <clears throat> One thing that all of us do is say Shema Yisrael. And we say Shema Yisrael with closed eyes. We close our eyes. We say Shema Yisrael. When we close our eyes, nobody knows what goes through our minds. What goes through our minds, what we're thinking about. What I mean is, not just, of course, nobody knows externally. Nobody knows what, what, what we think when we have our eyes open. <coughs> the point is that at that time, we can be thinking something real, or we can just be imagining. And if I know that this is what I'm supposed to be thinking, and therefore I make myself think that, doesn't mean that it's real to me, but because this is what I want to I think, and I think it. But it has to be real. 
I have to relate to it. There has to be something that I can, in my mind's eye, recognize as, as, as truth. And this is what happens. We say Shmai saw with closed eyes, then when we open our eyes, we see a totally different picture. Because, because when we were with closed eyes, we were not relating to reality, to our reality. We were doing some some thinking that is unrelated to the reality as we know it. I'm not saying that this is universal, I'm saying but this is possible. It has to be that what we think with closed eyes, we can then translate to what we see when our eyes are open. Some way. Surely when our eyes are open, there is a lot of distraction, a lot of questions, but at least we have a way to relate to it. This is why, as a matter of fact, the prescribed thought that one has to apply during Shema Yisrael, when he closes his eyes, is Hashem Echot, that God is one, and the Shulchan Aruch explains that the thought consists in God is one in the heavens and in the earth, and in all directions, all four, four corners of the world. In other words, even with our closed eyes, we're not thinking of God being one and there being nothing else, totally unrelated to our reality. We are defining our reality. We're saying the entire space that we are aware of is all, there's only one God in it, and it's all one with God. And Hasidus actually explains and asks this question. <clears throat> because in truth, Hasidus explains, and many of you have learned it already, that there is a higher level a higher level where it can be said that there is only God, there is no world altogether. But then, that thought would be meaningless when it come, when we open our eyes. Because we are completely out of our reality. And therefore, this is not, this is not what, what, what my soul is, is meant to do. Do I have you with me? You with me? You follow me? So far? Okay. <clears throat> so what I was attempting to do yesterday is in effect connect these two states, what we think with our closed eyes and what we see with our eyes open. So that even when our eyes are open, we don't see a totally contradictory state of affairs to what we thought when our eyes were closed. But rather we see something that that lends itself to to relating to that to to that which we thought with closed eyes. And here is how we presented it, as I said, in contrast to where we're coming from, because this is the real culprit. This is the real difficulty. Were it not for an opposite view, it would be perfectly natural for a person to view the world the way the Torah presents it. As we see, we learn with children, God created the heavens and the earth, and no child ever opened his eyes. Really? What do you mean? It made perfect good sense to him.
he saw, yes, there is order to the world. There's meaning to the world. And therefore, it is a creation. He would never think that the world evolved itself. From um, to, um, in a meaningless path, uh, path pattern, he will right away see. Yes, there is definitely meaning to the world. And if you tell me it's a creation, oh, it makes perfect good sense. Of course, it's a creation. But because <clears throat> of a of a <clears throat> completely misinterpreted, mis and uh, <clears throat> uh, represented view that we were exposed to, which what mean? Evolution, and evolution brings with it a whole a whole slew of world views. And we bring this with us, we carry this with us wherever we go. We have to show that contrast and show how, and recognize how the world is to be viewed from a Torah perspective that coincides with with the idea of Hashem Echod when we close our eyes. And then we have to see, yes, I can recognize that such a, that, that I can recognize that presence in the world. It's real. This is the needle in the haystack that we want to find. And once we identify it, then we can start working on ourselves and really bring it to reality. The haystack is the whole mix of the whole confusion that's going on. Total disarray, meaningless existence. And, and, and the view that everything pulls um, its own wagon. So if we understand that, yes, indeed, there is order to the world, like I've illustrated this, that day and night, day and night, from a scientific and worldly perspective, is an accident, is a meaningless phenomenon. The, the, what really happens is that the earth tilts around and it's and it faces the sun then it becomes day it tilts around a little more and then it it's in opposite the sun and then it becomes night there is no such thing as day and night day and night was not a creation it's a result of of a certain physical phenomenon but the Torah says no sir the Torah says day and night was created a real creation as we discussed in previous times, it's, um, you can please look up in the archives, that as a matter of fact, day and night were created before sun and moon were created. That's how the Torah relates it. And the sun and moon were brought into being, as a matter of fact, on a Wednesday, to fill and to serve during the day and night. It isn't that the sun and the moon define day and night. No, the day and night were created before. And the sun and the moon came to serve in those periods. Yes. Yes. See, there, there's, there is, the, um, I'm sorry, there is a lot of details that need to be understood and learned. In the first day of creation, it says, there was light and dark. Two different lights? Yeah, it says so. God separated darkness from light. And there's a lot of explanation inside that. See, this explains what this light refers to, what this light, 
this and this that and that. But the important thing is that on that very first day of creation, it says, that God called, named light day, and darkness he called night. And I, again, I would urge you to look it up in, in our archives, explain the significance of giving it a name. What's the point, what's the difference if you call it dark and light, or you call it uh, night and day? The significance of giving it a name is that it, it is defined as an entity unto itself. Not just merely because it's dark and light, but because it's a, a, dark and, a light and dark. But because this is such a, a, a unique period in the title itself. There is much to talk about it, and, and we, can't, we can't go into a tangent in every, every detail, but the point is that as a human being, Everybody recognizes that there is a perfect order in the world on that level. Night and day continue to exist in a perfect fashion for thousands and thousands and thousands of years because it's a real creation. And we know like I mentioned yesterday also, that daytime is not just because it's light, but it's daytime, it has a different effect on the person. And nighttime has a different effect on the person. It's not, it's not just the effect of light and, and light and dark. Because if, you, if, it's, if it's nighttime and you open up any amount of electrical light and it becomes perfectly bright, it doesn't render it day. You can never call it day. You say it's very bright, but day is a different, a different has a different quality. Maybe as we go on, you know, in the future, we'll have, be able to focus in on, on the on the significance of that. Uh, we have to limit our discussion, you know, what we mentioned to a certain a certain degree. <clears throat> what? Sorry. What? What's an eclipse? Uh, I'm considered as dark, like it's daytime. It's night. It's light. It's dark in the middle of the day. I know, but like, is it? But it's still day. If, I mean, if that's what I mean. There is whatever significance in the eclipses, but it doesn't change it into night. What about places that like? Are like always, always have light, like um, a target or something. I heard it's like 23 hours of light or something. Right. Well, well you go into the North Pole, you have six uh, six months light and six months darkness. Uh, yeah. Right. So that's that's on parts of the world that are not inhabited, not meant for for normal human habitation. But the normal, what's called the the Chelag Hayishuv, human habitation, where the human being is supposed to live and develop, is has a normal span of day and night. Because a human being needs day and night. And there are different mitzvahs that you do at night, different mitzvahs that you do at day, by day. No, no. You can live there, but it's not a habitable... You can live there, you know, if you have a purpose. It's not, it's not a habitable place as as uh, um, for normal human life. If you live there, you have to import all your food, you have to import <laughs> everything. Um, another illustration of this, this is the, also, it's in the archives. Again, I would urge you to look back. Um, we discussed the the sequence of events in the creation of the world as the Torah describes it. And it says that on the third day God created vegetation. Vegetation, all kinds of growth, the, 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 the plant 
plant water. Then, on the sixth day, he created animals. Then, on the afternoon of the sixth day, he created Odom, he created man. And he told Odom that everything that I created is for you. And you have to rule the whole world. You have to rule, you have to rule the whole world. Uh, so, um, was Adam Tzadik, or was he, I mean, like, was his Yitzhak Farah Atta, like, outside of him, the snake, I mean, or what was Adam Tzadik? I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss it another time. Let me just point out this. this oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, so okay. So there were. Th- this was a sequence of events. Now let's see and try to analyze and understand the, vegeta- the vegetation and the f- and then there was the fish and the birds and then there were animals all created prior to Odom. When Odom came, God said to Odom, "Okay, I'm created all for your sake." What does this mean? What was the state? Of all that was created, after all, there were individual days. What was the state of the vegetable and the state of the fish and the, and the animals prior to the creation of Adam and Adam assuming the reins of the reins of the world, the rulership of the world? And what was their state afterwards? And if we, if we examine this, we will see like this, that prior to Odom, up until the creation of Odom, everything that was created was created as an individual entity unto itself. Every plant was, quote unquote, concerned about itself. It had, didn't have a further purpose than itself. Its ability to reproduce and to grow and so forth and produce seed, this was all inherent in the very creation. So therefore, each each one of these, uh, each vegetable and each fish, every species that was created had only one thing in mind, itself. Then Odom Marishun was created. Okay, let's step back a bit. Okay, if everything is is concerned about itself, what kind of world do we have? A world of chaos. Chaos, what chaos is? Chaos means disarray, disorganized. Each thing is pulling for itself. Each thing is only interested in itself and interested in anything else. It has no purpose outside of, 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 preserve, of self-preservation, of self-promotion. Perfect chaos. A world in this way <clears throat> without any purpose or guide. Then Odomonition was created. And God said to him, all of this that you see is for you and that you have to rule it. The year do, you have to actually rule it. You have to capture the world. That's what it says in the title. You have to capture everything in the world and have to rule it. What did this do to the rest of the creation? It put a totally different perspective on everything that exists. Let's examine, as we did then, one simple thing. Let's examine an apple. Prior to the Mauritian, the apple, the apple tree was only interested in the apple tree. The apple tree, as such, doesn't need the apple, the, the juicy fruit. It needs a seed in order to produce another apple tree. 
doesn't need the, the juicy fruit. So therefore, it's the, the juicy fruit is a totally is a byproduct completely. It's meaningless. The animals couldn't eat the fruit either. There was no animals even before. And only on the sixth day, the animals were created. And only after that, God said that, that the fruits and everything is given, yeah, I'm giving you as food, and also to the animals. Before that, perfect. It's nothing. It's a meaningless, a meaningless um, uh, 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 entity. And in that state, perhaps it is true to say that the principle the principal um, existence of that fruit is its seed rather than the fruit. Because that serves a purpose for that's for the tree. The tree needs it for itself. Once the animals were created and then Odom origin, because the, the organization actually was established by Odom, when the Odom was created, and God rendered and relinquished everything to Odom and says, this is food for you. It reversed the entire view of the world. I see it. It reversed the entire view of the world. Instead of saying that the tree is growing food for itself, the tree is now growing food for Odom. And what is the principal product of that tree? Not the seed. But the fruit, that's its real product. Why? Because it serves a purpose for other. Which means that here is where we see, just connecting it back to what we started with, where we see the, the, the unity. We see, yes, the fruit was meant for Odom this because it's one God that created them both. And it's not a disparate, um, uh, you know, disparate, separated, un unrelated entities, the fruit tree and Odom. They are very much related. The fruit tree is meant for Odom. And the tree produces fruit for Odom Arish. And the fruit and the tree produces better fruit if Odom Orishin merits it. You know what merits it? If he deserves it. And if he doesn't deserve it, he produces worse fruit. Because that's exactly what he's doing. He's producing fruit for Odom. Nothing to do with itself. I'll take you one further step and then we'll go back up. I know uh, <coughs> as you had a question. The next step in, in the completion of the creation actually took place a thousand year late, years later, approximately. Well, it's more than a thousand. After, after, the, after the flood. After the flood, when the whole world was destroyed and was saved by Noyach, that doesn't tell you it He was saved by Neach. Then God said to Neach that now not only are the fruits and vegetables yours to consume, is for you to eat, but you you can eat the animals. The animals are also your food, food for you. Up until then, he couldn't eat animals. He was not allowed to eat, to kill animals and eat. He could use animals, he can have benefit on animals like uh, from wool and other things, but not food, not as food. And we will examine just briefly what happened over here. Why is that changed? Odom Mauritian clearly was the most important creation in the, huh? Adam. Adam. Was certainly clear the most important creation. He's at the center of the world, and everything was created for his sake. However, this is in Adam's recognition. He knew what he represents. He knew that he serves Hashem, and therefore everything is for him. After 
Noyach, and after the flood, it was recognized in the entire world. All animals, everything recognized that they were all saved on account of Noyach. And therefore, the centrality of the human being was established even in the eyes of the animal. And that's why, at that point, the animal also became food for for, for the human being. Because now, the whole world came to complete unity. There is a human being, and he rules everything, and everything is for him. Even though, in their own consciousness, perhaps, you know, the animal have, you know, is interested in itself and so forth, with all its interests, its main purpose to be in this world is to serve the human being. This is why it reproduces, this is why it, 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 it grows and so forth. If we can recognize, can relate to this view of the world, then we can translate that which we see when our eyes are closed and we say Shema Yisrael into that which we see when our eyes are open. <coughs> we can see that there is a similarity, a connection. And therefore, when we go to Shul and Davin, or we learn Torah, especially I'm talking about now in the Aseris and Tshuva, we do Tshuva, and we spoke the other time last week about Tshuva and returning to Hashem. This allows us to have a direct, a direct relationship, a direct identity. Yes, I can see the presence of Hashem. I don't see Hashem, but I can see His hand in the, in the creation. The, the his creation, the creation is not a strange, is not devoid of, of of the unity that is that is the, the product of, of the Father that Hashem created the world. Okay, just one second. Okay, Ezra. This might be a question for Adam, but a lot of the So you're right. This is outside of the of the of the content of this discussion. What we're looking for is not proof, not you know, argue or one point or another. It is a human view that permits relating the presence of the world as we see it to the truth as we know it from the time. So that we can relate to these things personally. And as we say in the morning, we wake up in the morning, we say, The first thing in the morning that we wake up, what do we become cognizant of? Of the presence of Hashem who has woken us up and returned my soul to Returned my soul to Why do we become cognizant of it? Because we see, we woke up, and it's it's a different time. It's a reju- the world has rejuvenated, as we saw yesterday. And so I can see the present, uh, the hand of God in, in what I'm in what I'm experiencing. Even if 
we are still in uh, under the influence and so forth of of other of, of of ideas that we brought with us from elsewhere, but at least we can relate to it. We can see how the, how we can relate to this reality. And this is the meaning of finding the needle in the haystack, knowing it's there. Now I have to work and clear my mind out and get a clear picture and and wash out anything, any 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 hay that don't belong there, any hay that confuses my mind. But at least I know what I'm looking for. This is the, the, the meaning of clarity of, what, of where we're going and where, where we stand. What we're looking for. I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Of course. What is the other question? The other question is, is Malthus a spiritual place? Or is it Malthus this place? Or is this, is this not Malthus in this year? Okay. Okay, we'll take up these questions at the time when we discuss this. Okay? I'm sorry. It's out, it's out of context. I understand what, what you're going for, but it's not, uh, it's not really a topic of discussion. Um, what I want is, and that I'm, I'm speaking to all of you, what I want is that we should be able to relate to words of Torah that we learn it in our own words. To quote and to repeat what we learn is very important. But we have to be able to translate it in our own words. Not everything, like we talk about Malchus and all that, but to translate the, the principle, I'm davening, who am I davening to? What does it mean to me? It has to mean something to me. Because ultimately, who knows and recognizes the presence of Hashem? It is the human soul. And therefore, we have to find it in our soul. What you know? What it means? What do we see? We've discussed, as I said, I would urge you to go back to some of the archives. Uh, that, as a matter of fact, an animal does not have that capacity to see value in the world. To see that yes, the apple was created for the sake of apple doesn't have that idea whatsoever. Because the animal is involved in itself and whatever it can grab, it grabs. It's not taking it from Hashem, it's taking it because it's there to, to be taken. But the human being in general, particularly, most particularly the Yid, as we've discussed then also, that the final, actually the final stage of creation, I should say, the final stage of creation was at Matan Torah, at the giving of the Torah, which again, it's the, I discussed it quite um, extensively in those archives, and I would urge you to go back to it. <coughs> um, to Ayid, he sees everything as you know, from a meaningful perspective. Like we explained yesterday, that even when he sits in front of his table and there's a piece of bread in front of him and it's all baked and it's all prepared, he wouldn't eat it without making a bracha. And what does a bracha say? That Hashem brings forth bread from the earth. How can I say Hashem brings forth bread from the earth? The bread is right here in front of me. 
but the, the, the point of the brachi is that I'm not eating the bread because I grabbed it from the earth. I took something that doesn't belong to me. But rather because Hashem gives it to me, this I'm eating it from Hashem's hand. Because that's the meaningful level at which a human being lives. I eat lips. He does not live at the physical, at the plain physical level, even though he partakes of everything physical. But he completely reinterprets it and says that everything that's in the physical world was is a presentation by God for him. And therefore to him, this is a godly presentation. He's eating it from Hashem's hand. And that's why he's able to eat it. Not eating it because the tree is producing it, but because Hashem gave it. Then, then he can he can partake, he can relate to it. So, if we're asking the question, what is the practical implication of our discussion? The practical implication of our discussion is that we have to be able to redefine our real world and to see that the world that we live in is a meaningful and godly world. This is when we can stand up and, and uh, with a full heart and open mind, open see them and that. And we can say that the whole world is praising Hashem, as we say in the Siddur. Where do we see that the whole world is praising Hashem? Because everything is fulfilling Hashem's, Hashem's directive. The trees produce fruit. They don't, they aren't interested in themselves. They're interested in doing what Hashem wants them to do. So Hashem's presence is, is actually expressed by everything in the world. This is why we say in Davening that the whole world praises Hashem. Again, we have to understand that there are definitely madregas and so forth that, you know, the deeper involvement and and and, and uh, deeper understanding and, and much more significant um, uh, content as well. But at least the, at the minimum, we have to be clear what world we live in. Then we can walk on a straight path. And, we, and whatever we do, we develop into into the solid direction. So that when we close our eyes and say Shema Yisrael, we open we, we open our eyes, we don't see totally two different worlds. Not only different worlds, but contradictory worlds. Okay. So basically, you're saying that we have to, in our daily life, we have to keep in mind, you know, that the world was created by Hashem and that Hashem runs everything, and we have to this in mind. Is that what you're No. That's for sure we have to have in mind. But the intent of our discussion is. Where do we recognize it? That this which we have in mind is not just something that we implant into our mind, but I can actually reflect upon it. I can actually develop that thought. Personally, I can, I can grow in that thought. Do you follow what I'm saying? It is not just a thought that presented to me and I know it's true and I trust my rabbi and therefore I'm going to think like that. But in fact, I can I can personally relate to it. And once I can personally relate to it, then I can begin to reflect on it and develop it and get um, greater clarity and grow in it. But this is what I described. When you see the world, not just as a physical world, but a world representing a perfect unity, Yeah. That, that would be a practical 
those things that you said during the lecture, which is how it all works, and uh, to, 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 to kind of transpose the well, let me onto this world to see how it's... Well, let me ask you, let me ask you, have you ever contemplated the world for yourself? Sure. And what does the world mean to you? Contemplating the world meaning what? I mean, what is your world? What, what does it mean you, you get up in the morning, what does it mean you... You eat, what does it mean you sleep, what does it mean you walk, what does it mean you talk, what does it mean um, you well, work? I, mean, I, don't, I don't come to play a control, but like when I, when I learn something, when I learn something about the citizen, I talk about, talk, talks about, you know, like for example, the, the meaning of Moedani, something like that, I, I don't really come to play a control, but I don't know. Well, let me, let, let's understand that <clears throat> everything you, you learn in a, in a cipher, in a book, does not remain in the book. It comes into your mind and it comes into your heart. And in your mind, in your heart, you have flesh and blood so that this which you learn has to be able to relate to your flesh and blood. In other words, this is not just an unrelated knowledge. This is a knowledge that defines to you who you are. And it defines to you who you are with your agreement, now, which you can relate to it. Yes, that's, that's the way I think. It's real to me. Apply what I learned from my personal, uh, the, the personal, so when I learned it, well, yes, but that, uh, again, there is a broad spectrum and you can apply anything you learn. All I was trying to, to do is to define a very simple, a base level. You know what the base level means? A basic, a starting point. Where is our reality? Where is our reality? The reality... The Torah is, is Hashem's reality. But where is your reality? You exist... You, you, you don't exist in the book. You exist right here sitting. sitting. The, the, right. The goal is is to correlate. But the, what I'm talking about is that your reality shouldn't be contradicting the total reality. What would be an example of my reality? And the example would be if you say, I'll give you a very simple example, right? Um, the Torah says that Hashem provides Parnos. You know what Parnos is? Yeah. Your, your means of livelihood. Money or food for your table. And then, with God's help, you get married. And now you said, okay, let's go home. Let's see what Hashem, how Hashem filled my refrigerator. I come to the refrigerator, it's empty. Where is the food? Oh, I have to go on myself, but I thought that Shem provides it. No, you have to go to work. But Hashem, Hashem provides it. This is where the contradiction is. The point is, you have to be able to correlate these two parts of your life. So that would be, be a correlation. Think about it, right? the vessel, but the no, no. What I'm saying, see, yes, that, that would be a way to, to. <laughs> that would be a way for you to explain. Okay, this is what it means. But perhaps you are not bothered by the question, but someone else may be bothered. And says, I don't understand this. The world, the presence of the world, contradicts the reality that you teach me in the table. 
Where is Hashem? Where is Hashem? In my world. As I said before, that the reason I'm discussing this is not because any child that learns Torah, the purity needs to have the discussion. The reason I'm discussing this is because we had we had other kinds of exposures. We had a completely different interpretation of the world. Totally. They studied the world and came to a completely different conclusion. Like Ezra, we can't even relate to it after we discuss it. Because he's bothered by certain questions. What would be the solution? So the oh, method, the, the method to correlate is <coughs> that <coughs> even though you have to go to work and you have to plow the earth and you have to plant the trees and then you have to reap the fruit and you would think, okay, this is all a, a natural physical process and you and, and the Torah tells us and what we're discussing is no this is not all a natural physical process because after that you plow and after that you seed and it grows what grows a fruit why does a fruit grow because it's meant for you <coughs> God had his reasons why he had to work. But where do I see the presence of God in all that that's going on? I see it in simply in the fact that after it grows, it grows something just for me, that the tree doesn't need that at all. That's when I see, oh, this is real. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm trying to see the presence of Hashem in everything. Where do you see that after you worked, you plowed and seeded and watered and, and cared for that tree, where do you see that you get the fruit from Hashem's hand? When you say a bracha, you say the bracha. Where do you see it? Where do you see Hashem's presence in this whole process? Where does your mind find it? In the Torah. In the Torah. You're just repeating what it says. Where do you see it? That's what I'm saying. This is exactly what I'm saying. Where do we see in our daily lives? Where do we see the reality of it? How do you... Where do you see the reality of the presence of Hashem? Mm -hmm. After, since after, in order for you to get food, you have to work, and and do everything all the way to the very last, to the very last detail. Nothing happens by itself. Right. Where, so, so where, where is the presentation? Well, for me, I, I personally I can imagine this. I'm saying, I can imagine. That's what I'm saying. That I, that we need to be able to. And you may not have this, you know, the, the, you may not have been exposed to 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 other ideas. So you just have to accept no, what the Torah says. Right. So I'm saying that that the fact that the tree, after all is after the whole process, the tree produces a fruit which is totally meaningless for the tree. Meaningless, useless. The tree doesn't need a fruit. The fruit is not needed for the tree. Okay. It's not for the sake of the tree. It's not for the sake of the tree, it's for your sake. This is where you see that this is made for you, that Hashem made it. That, that, that's so, uh, so that would be, that, is that the practical application? That would be a different about basically to, in your mind, to whatever you do, imagine that it's no matter no. I, I just, uh, the practical, uh, yes, from that perspective, the point is that the, the practical application is that 
there is no contradiction between what you believe and what you see. You can correlate them. You don't have to go into your imagination and forget about the reality as I know it in order to accept, to, to say everything is from Hashem. We all believe everything Hashem. The point is, oh, but I have to close my eyes to everything else that I know. No, we don't have to. It's part of my reality. That's the point. That way, we can delve into it personally and get to really involved and get to understand it. Yes, sir. Um, what about when it says that, like the Jews are are um, fruit growing trees and like going are plain trees or something? What's the meaning exactly? I mean, like Jews are like fruit growing trees and going are just plain hmm. non fruit growing trees. Okay. Again, uh, these are all very important, very uh, nice things. And eventually we'll we'll we talk about it. We talk about the Jews and Goyim and so forth. We'll talk about this to you, But this is a, has a, a very narrow purpose in this discussion. Every discussion, I'd like to narrow in, you know, focusing on on, on the point so that we, we 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 get a clear clarity in the point. And this is. Um, uh, <clears throat> a point that. As we said before, it identifies the needle that's hiding in the haystack. Because in order to have a fruit, there's a whole bunch of hay that creates a big haystack that conceals it, conceals God's hand in it. Can you go with the God's gospel? Yeah. So basically, have to, every, whatever the daily things you do, have in order to see the hand of Hashem, we have to whatever, clear all the, all the hay. That's right. The and then say, okay, oh, I see. Yes, this is a godly creation. This is not something natural. The tree didn't produce a fruit for its own sake. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So is that, is that what, 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 what all the action that we do, that we should do, or is it just some particular, like everything you do, you should always no. see No, 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 no. This simply gives you a clarity of what it is that we are trying to accomplish. We are trying to have a clear view of our lives around the principle that that Hashem created the world and that we are as Hashem's servants. And then we learn the title how we serve Hashem and what we have to do. But to have just a clarity in, in where we're going, what are we trying to 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 understand? What are we trying to to break through? So we're talking physical sight knowledge. Sorry. Are we talking little little physical sight? Well, this is this is physic this is physical sight that only the human intellect can identify. Like I said before, the cat will see a, an apple, he won't see God's hand in it. He will see just something that it can eat. But a human being, especially a will say, hey, what is this, what is this all about? And he learns and later says, oh, this meant for you. And he sees Hashem's hand. And that's why he makes a bracha. Gentlemen.